Aloha attendees. My name is Roger Jelinek. I'm executive director of the Hawaii Book of Music Festival. And uh, pleasure to uh, have you come and see this very special program, a remarkable invention and a piece of technology um, that's going on on Kauai, the only, I believe, the only place in the world that's actually doing it. Um, uh, I just want to let you know that if your Ohana and network were not able to attend and would like to, that, that the session is being recorded and live streamed on Facebook and YouTube, and it will be up on the Better Tomorrow Speaker Series YouTube channel in the next week or so. And then uh, maybe a couple of weeks, it will be available in the form of a highlight um, mode, much shorter, on the uh, Book of Music Festival website, where it will be there for almost a year, if not longer. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to Brittany Light of Honolulu Civil Beat, who will be your moderator. Aloha. Thank you, Roger. And hi, everyone out there. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this evening for a conversation on the theme of innovation. Uh, for a conversation about the West Kauai Energy Project. If you don't know what that is, you will soon find out. Um, my name is Brittany Light. I'm a reporter at Honolulu Civil Beat. Uh, I also live on Kauai, where KIUC, the Kauai Island Utility Cooperative, is developing a, a unique solar and hydropower plant called the West Kauai Energy Project. Our panelist this evening is David Bissell, who has served as the president and CEO of KIUC since 2010. So no one better to introduce us to this project. Uh, in 2017, KIUC drew international attention when the world's largest utility scale solar plus battery facility developed by Tesla was unveiled. Now KIUC and AES Corp, a developer of a wide variety of generating plants are together developing an integrated pumped storage hydropower solar and battery project, the first of its kind in the world. Upon completion, KIUC will exceed 80% in renewable sourced energy. The project itself would provide up to a quarter of Kauai's power supply and gradually lower its 34,000 customers electric bills. David earned his bachelor's degree in accounting and finance from the State University of New York at Brockport and his MBA from the Kelly School of Business at Indiana University. Welcome, David. Thank you, Brittany, and aloha, everyone. So, so David, you've been in this job for about 11 years now. Um, Tell us what have been your overarching goals in your position as the head at KIUC? Uh, and what is it like being in your position at a time when there's such a dramatic push to transition to renewable energy? Thank you. It's uh, been very exciting in my position for 11 years as CEO. And before that, I, I was a CFO. So I came over in a financial uh, role and was promoted to CEO. But, my goals really are the goals of my board of directors. Uh, KIUC is a cooperative. We're the only cooperative utility, electric utility in the Hawaiian island chains. Every other island is served by eco companies, which are investor owned companies. So what, what makes us different as a cooperative is we have an elected board of directors and it's now we're nonprofit. So any of the earnings above what we need to operate and meet our debt, uh, go into the accounts of the, what we call members, we don't call them customers, they're members of the cooperative. And that's kind of a long introduction to our goal setting process here, but it goes back to the members, the people that pay the bills and are the residents of Kauai elect directors and the directors come in and their job is to represent the interests of the people. So really ever since we were formed as a cooperative in 2002, when a, a group of uh, local business people and community members made a really outrageous attempt to come and take by the utility when it was for sale from a citizen's utility. And after a couple of attempts, they were successful, got it done. But 
back in 2002 and even before that, one of the big parts of wanting to be a cooperative was controlling the island's energy destiny. And the people did not want to be oil fired, uh, fossil fuel based. They wanted the bills to be more stable. They realized that renewable energies could and should be part of our uh, energy mix here on the island. We have vast natural resources. And really since we were put together, that was part of our, our goal was to become more resilient and internally focused using our own resources instead of outside resources for our energy needs. So back as early as, I think it was 2006, our board of directors and one of their strategic plans uh, came up with a 50% uh, renewable target. I guess actually it was 2008. They set a 50% renewable target. Really uh, out there forward thinking because we had about 5% uh, renewable at that time, some legacy hydro projects. Uh, really no other renewables were in the money, but they knew they had to get there. So they set a, set a really forward looking goal. And it was 50% uh, by 2023 was the goal. So lo and behold, here we sit in 2021. Uh, last year we hit 67% uh, renewable on the island. So the goal setting by the people and by our directors really pushed us forward and we were able to achieve. And I would love if you could share a little bit more about the uh energy sources that power Kauai and, and how that has changed over time um, and, and maybe beyond just being renewable, what are the different sources? Um, and, and, you know, since, was it 2002 that the co-op was formed? Since then, how, how has that changed? Yeah, in 2002, when we were formed, the, the island was just transitioning out of the sugarcane era. The mills were either shut down or almost all gone. Um, I think we had a little bit of uh, a gas, the byproduct of sugarcane biomass, basically, on, on our uh, grid at that time. Um, that shortly went away as the last mills shut down. So we really started out with some legacy hydro plants from those mills, a few, a few small ones that the old plantations had used to for uh, their energy needs. And when we started, it was about six or eight percent of the energy was coming from the legacy hydro. The rest was coming from oil fired uh, sources between our, our two uh, main power plants, Port Allen and Kapaya, outside of Lahui here. So 92 uh, percent oil fired, uh, a little bit of uh, legacy hydro. And uh... Fast forwarding to, to the future, is the goal to be completely renewable um, energy based or will, will there always be a place for, for some of these, um, these other sources? Well, the state, state's goal by 2045 is to be 100% renewable. Uh, we think we can get there. We feel we have to get there. Um, when we say we're at 67% last year, that doesn't mean we've got a, a smooth track to get into 100%, however. A uh, lot of uh, growth comes could come from electric vehicles, for example. Uh, you always have to, be, have to be developing new sources. You gotta be looking forward if the population grows, if, if load grows, you have to keep up with it. And a lot of uh, technical challenges to operating a grid on, on full renewable, which, is one of the biggest achievements we've had here, at least during the daylight hours, when the sun is shining, we've routinely operated our grid on 100% renewable for hours at a time, for really thousands of hours last year, we were able to do that. So pretty much last year, every day the sun was shining brightly, we were at 100% renewable during those days, during those hours, which really no other grid in the country is doing, particularly with the high amount of uh, solar powered energy we're using here, because of course, solar is clouds come over, you can gain or lose the solar dependent on where the clouds are at. So it's a real challenge for a grid. But our engineers and technicians have, have done really well. Our, our reliability was the best ever last year, even with all the solar and really proud of what we've been able to accomplish. 
So, so let's get into talking about the West Kauai Energy Project and, and how it fits into KIUC's renewable energy goals. Um, you know, I'm curious if this project is perhaps in some way um, an, an answer to a problem, um, you know, or a challenge uh, as you work to, to increase the amount of renewable energy sources. And, and first, I think just in very simple terms, you know, we'll get into the details, but in simple terms, what is this project and, and why is it different? This project is, it's really an old technology being applied in a, in a new way. Uh, pump storage hydro is out throughout the world. There's quite a few large pump storage hydro projects on the mainland even. And ultimately what it means is you're taking some source of energy, in our case, it's solar, a big solar field, they run pumps and they push water uphill. So when the energy is available, you push water uphill. In our case, we push it from one uh, old uh, irrigation reservoir, basically an irrigation pond. We have the uh, PV, the solar energy will we'll produce, run these big pumps during the daytime when the sun's shining, push the, push the water uphill to another, another reservoir and it'll sit there and collect as the, as the sun's producing. Now in the evening, in order if it's a bad day when, the, when the, uh, there's no sun or limited sun, we'll let that water come out of the upper reservoir, flow downhill through a pipe, spin a turbine and, and make uh, electricity. So it'll be stored, it's got nice value of uh, water is a fairly uh, efficient storage mechanism, a big uh, reservoir can hold a lot of energy. And it's very good because when the sun's not shining, we just uh, let it run downhill. I don't know if that was a simple explanation to start off on it, but that, that's the basic premise is about as simple as it gets, pushing water uphill and bringing it, letting it flow back down in, in the uh, nighttime hours. So if I'm understanding this correctly, this project would help uh, overcome that challenge of, of just the simple fact that you can't you know, the sun isn't gonna produce energy when it's dark outside? <laughs> well, there's two challenges, at least two challenges we're facing related to the sun. One is we've been a victim of our own success. We have so much solar and so much other renewables that when the sun's shining, and when I said we were at 100% renewable, that's great, but it means you can't take any more uh, solar-based sun during the day because we don't have any load. We're, unlike a lot of areas, we're our own grid. There's no place outside of Kauai that the energy can come, come from or go to. So we have to perfectly balance the supply and the, and the demand here. And that means if we're full up with renewables, we have to uh, either curtail them, shut them down because we don't have enough load, or you have to be able to store the energy somewhere. And we've been successful, the project with Tesla, um, another two projects we've done with AES, who's also working with us on the pump storage project, have combined uh, large PV fields with battery storage. And they've worked really well, but that's basically are holding four or five hours, <clears throat> excuse me, four or five hours worth of, worth of energy. And still quite a bit of the solar um, time period is going into straight to our grid. <clears throat> Once the grid's full as it is now, we have to take that energy and it's gotta all be stored. So, excuse me, sorry about that. So instead of having five hours or so, we need to have eight or 12 hours of storage and using battery technology that gets to be very expensive. So problem it solved is we wanted to still bring in our cheapest energy source, which is photovoltaic, but we need to be able to store it in a cost-effective way and the water in reservoirs is a very cost-effective way to have what we call bulk storage, longer duration storage. So every day we'll be able to store 12 hours of output, basically the entire daylight suntime uh, solar production and store that in water and have it sitting in the reservoir if we need to. So explain exactly what about this technology is so groundbreaking. It, it sounds like some of these technologies are not new, but, but layering them and, and piecing them together in this way is new. Um, is that right? Yeah, the part that's, there's a couple parts of this that's in a, very innovative. 
One is it's the first that we're aware of that's uh, tying uh, pump storage to pump storage hydro to uh, photovoltaic, a large solar field. And that's because the challenge there is that solar, of course, it's the sun comes and goes, you have energy, you don't have energy, and it's difficult to keep these pumps operating under that uh, environment. Usually these uh, large pump storage projects on the mainland at International, there's a reliable fossil fuel, be it coal or, or some other uh, fossil type fuel that's running steadily. And it's kind of, a, they store it when there's a price imbalance between the market of coal versus other, uh, other uh, sources of energy. So when they've got a cheaper, stable source, they'll pump the water, store it and bring it back down when, that, when that, the energy prices are more expensive and that, that works for them. Ours is working with a variable uh, technology, the sun, and that's just not, not good on pumps to have, ener have energy levels go high, go low. It's hard for the pumps to operate. So that's where the, the really third component of this project comes in, batteries. This will have two hours of battery storage, which will enable the sun to go into a battery, and then we can use the batteries to regulate the pumping. So if there's more or less solar, the batteries can take more or less and keep the pumps at an even level, and then they'll effect, efficiently pump the water uphill. So it gets a little complex, but it's uh, it's really using it for solar is the unique aspect, and it's been a real uh, um, technical challenge for our engineers and, and the AES engineers to figure out how to do this reliably and uh, cost effectively. So is it Kauai's uh, very dependable sunlight that is creating the conditions where you know this small island is is uh, poised to have this really uh, new innovative technology? I mean, uh, why why isn't this already happening or in the works other places? What what are what's creating the conditions where Kauai is able to be you know number one here to do this? Sunlight's part of it, but. It's an interesting fact that really Hawaii in general and Kauai in particular, our sunlight and, and solar regime is not that great compared to some that's, we're not like we're out in a desert and have a, a steady sun's always shining type of thing. Our, our sun comes and goes, so it's more challenging technology to keep it in and operate a good reliably, reliably. But we do have good sun, good enough sun. We also, the unique characteristics on Kauai is we have a lot of land, a lot of uh, fallow farmland that allows these fairly big solar fields to go into a productive use because it's, it's land that's not being used for other, other purposes. For example, this project's gonna use about 350 acres of land, give or take, but there's thousands of acres in the vicinity out there that's uh, either being used for farming or is sitting on fallow right now. So a lot of land is a good thing. Um, the land is relatively inexpensive on the island, which is the second thing. Um, and then the geograph geography down there on the west side of Kauai, where you can go from flat, basically sea level, up to several thousand feet over a, a relatively short amount of uh, area. So it's efficient with the high, uh, they call it high head in the, in the industry, the, the um, altitude gains over a short area, and then having the legacy, legacy uh, plantation infrastructure, the reservoirs that are already there that just have to be rehabilitated is, is what makes it makes it the perfect location. You got geography, you got sun, and you got relatively uh, cheap and available land. Yeah, let's let's talk about the the geography a little bit more. Um, so it sounds like um, the west side is is really uniquely positioned to host this project, and and perhaps it it wouldn't work as well other places. Um, talk a little bit more about that, and also just describe for folks um, who have some familiarity with the west side of Kauai, kind of where this is, and and you know, would you encounter it in a car or on a hiking trail, or or just exactly where is this? Well, it starts off on the Mana Plains. Uh, kind of across from the Pacific Missile Range facility on the far, almost at the end of the road on Kauai as you head west. But it'll be, the field will be back closer to the cliffs. And they may, 
they won't be very visible as you drive by. You may be able to see the field a little bit, but it's going to be quite a ways back towards the cliffs. So the, the solar farm and the the uh, actual powerhouse and pumping stations will be back in that same general area. Shouldn't be much of a vis visual uh, impact down there. Then it's all going to be pretty much a piping and underground piping up to the reservoir and the Pua Opai Reservoir, which is actually on uh, DHHL land, uh, the Hawaiian uh, homestead land. Um, that reservoir today is sitting pretty much empty. It'll get a little bit, it'll fill up a little bit when it's rained, but it's essentially been uh, decommissioned um, because of regulations around dams makes it pretty expensive for DHHL to keep it up. And then the third reservoir that comes into play as you go farther uphill in a, the Kokei State Park is the Pu'ulua Reservoir, which is pretty well known out here. It's where a lot of uh, residents and even some visitors go to fish for trout. Uh, it's, it's at about quite a ways up, uh, almost to the visitor center in Kokei, and it's a pretty uh, popular recreation area. Nice thing about this project is that facility also is sitting way below capacity because of dam safety regulations and one of the things we'll do is we'll rehab the we'll rehab that reservoir bring it up to its full uh, capacity so instead when you go right now you go down and it looks to be about a third empty because it is <laughs> and we'll fix it um, get it up to standards get it up to all the safety standards so it'll be fully available it'll help the fishing help the recreation uh, we'll improve the roads to get in and out of all the reservoirs so that'll make it more available for the public and and on the uh, pool opai reservoir on dhhl and department of hawaiian homes it'll actually open it up to hawaiian beneficiaries to uh, live and have uh, farm farm plot lot, lots there there'll be several hundred uh, multi-acre farm lots agriculture lots for the uh, native hawaiian uh, beneficiaries to live and farm so right now it's it's basically barren land. It's it's a red dirt. Um, road access is poor. No electrical service at all, and no reliable uh, irrigation. We'll fix the irrigation system that's there. Uh, we'll maintain it. Um, get everything back up to its historic standards. So there'll be reliable water. There'll be electrical access up there, and we'll fix the roads. So that whole area can be put into productive use by the Hawaiian community. So this project proposes to, uh, you know, uh, activate some, some aging underutilized infrastructure, uh, irrigation, roads, uh, reservoirs. Um, it sounds like this project will have quite a few benefits for, for the broader community uh, beyond you know, the, the, the project's goals uh, in itself. Um, can you talk with me a little bit more about, about how this project has some just uh, natural community benefits based on, you know, what, what improvements you'll need to make anyway? Yeah, it's really a, kind of a classic public-private uh, partnership on this where the state agencies, and I've I've talked about two DLNR, Department of Land and Natural Resources, Department of Hawaiian Homelands. And the third one down on the plains is the Agribusiness Development Corporation that's where the uh, has the farmland down there. Well, they they simply don't have the money to invest into bringing these uh, assets back up to, to uh, their old condition where they're fully functional. And that's why they've been sitting there either empty or partially in use. We, as a utility, and because of what we're offsetting is the high cost of fossil fuel, we can invest in those resources, use them for dual purposes of irrigation for the farmland, both at the um, Department of Hawaiian Homelands area and down at the plains on the, on the ADC land. We'll, we can use the irrigation system for that to serve, the, serve it, uh, agriculture. And we can re realize from the investments in all that property to produce energy. So the energy energy makes the money available to get the benefits to the agriculture and to the community of better access, um, better recreation, and even such things as a better firefighting cap capabilities. Having these big reservoirs that helicopters and the firefighters can go to if there's a, 
a wildfire in Kokea, which are happening, seem to be happening more and more frequently, they'll be able to go down, dip, get water quickly, and hopefully be able to put uh, fires out quicker. So a lot of benefits, but it's really driven by ultimately this transition off oil. Um, cheaper, we, we can invest a lot of money and resources and still have lower cost energy for the people of Kauai, so it becomes a win-win. What has the community response been like so far, if, if you could sum it up? I mean, anytime there's change or something new, uh, you know, it it's, takes a while for folks to digest. Um, what kind of support or, or not has this project gotten? I think in general, it's been very, very well supported by the community. A lot of people are excited about it. A lot of people on the west side are excited about uh, getting these resources back into productive use. In fact, really since 2011, when I first became CEO, I heard from community members all the time, why aren't you guys doing more hydro? Um, people on Kauai recognize that there's a lot of hydro resources. A um, lot of uh, people you see in a grocery store or at Costco would be always say, hey, why, why don't we do this? Do more. So we started looking, looking hard at it. And ultimately, the best project that we found for, on the whole island was on the west side. And the West Kauai Energy Project really encompasses a, a tremendous amount of benefits. So I think the support's been good. Um, it's always in, in today's world, you always have to communicate. You got to work with the community really from start of the start of the idea as a, as a conceptual idea all the way to a completion. And it, and it won't end there. You still have to work with them as operating. So it's going to be a continual uh, community focus from us. and. We think it's very good for the community. It'll bring benefits for decades. And I think most of the people in the community uh, recognize that. In some ways, uh, is Kauai sort of a, a guinea pig, uh, you know, to, to kind of pilot this technology? Do you think, you know, if, if it's constructed here and if it's um, successful, do you think other places will will tap into this? Or um, again, is it kind of our unique geography and some of the unique conditions that make it really suitable for here? I think you'll see it in, in other places. And, and the analogy is really the, we started on Kauai, really had the first utility scale uh, solar and battery storage project anywhere in the world. Um, now they're all over the place, uh, being built all over Hawaii and really all over the world. And we were the innovator. We were the first, first one, the test case with Tesla. And one of the early ones from AES, Tesla was first. AES was the biggest in the world. And that technology is being applied all over now. So I think you'll see more of the, more of the integration of PV and pump storage uh, technology where the ge ge uh, geographic features allow it. Um, you, you hear more and more California out, out west and other states where their grid is having problems and storage becomes a, is becoming a big issue there. Um, if they have the areas where they can do it in a larger scale, I think you'll start seeing it more. And I think that ultimately that's why big companies like AES are interested in working with us here on Kauai and Tesla because it is a good test bed. We don't like to look at ourselves as a guinea pig. We like to look at ourselves as a is a test bed for innovation. Um, we've got a willing, willing uh, company, a good management team, good, good uh, engineers and and uh, technical people, and we work well with people from great companies and bringing those talents all to Kauai has produced pretty impressive results. Um, and, and of course, there's many feel good and and practical reasons to to launch a project like this that, that makes use of renewable energy more and, and gets you know, the, the co-op closer to its goal. Um, but then you know, there's also the fact that you're projecting this project will lower uh, members' bills. There's what, 34,000 um, customers that you call members uh, because they are. Uh, how will this affect you know, folks' bills. Um, you know, I think people will, will want to know that. How much savings can they expect? Will it be immediate? Will it be over time? Um, hopefully the answer is yes to both of those, that they'll see savings immediately and over time. It's always interesting here because 
when we talk about savings, we're talking comparing to what we would have paid under oil. And as we all know how volatile oil pricing is, the savings really depend on the cost of oil going forward. Uh, based on our projections, we think it'll save the people hundreds of millions of dollars. I think we're, we're forecasting 150 to $170 million in, in savings, net present value savings on the project over 20 or 25 years. Now, if oil goes down, as we saw a few years ago, or it goes down to $20, $30 a barrel long-term, the savings will be much less or non-existent. If it goes up to over 100, where it seems to be heading, the savings will be better. So it's really what oil is, because that's what we're avoiding by uh, bringing this project in. But we forecast it'll have it'll have material savings for membership. Um, a recent PUC filing, I think we estimated on average, it'll save a residential customer $20 a month over the life of the project, uh, likely starting out on the lower end and going higher as time goes forward. But it should, we certainly project it'll save, save money and it's also save using about 8 million gallons of oil a year on the island. So it's gonna save uh, carbon emissions and greenhouse gas emissions as well. It's becoming increasingly important, both for us on Kauai and throughout the state and the world for that matter. So should be good, good from an economic side. It, it certainly will be good from an environmental side in terms of our greenhouse uh, gas profile. And when you talk about the life of the project, what does that mean? Um, you know, is there kind of a an ending date when this isn't efficient anymore or doesn't work as well? Um, talk to me about that. It really depends on what new technologies are out there. This, this technology can last indefinitely. We have hydros that have been in service for over 100 years in multiple locations on the island. So the basic hydro technology is, is pretty, well, it's very reliable, very stable. It could be, could be there for 100 years or more. Now, will pricing, will be, there be some better technology that comes around that makes that um, not competitive and, and phased out over time? I, I don't know. I can't predict to that level of uh, accuracy, but it's going to be around for a long time. And the nice part is that we haven't talked about is after the, the debt is paid off on the project over 25 or 30 years, the pricing should be able to come down, assuming it stays in, in uh, service. There's really no input prices to it. The sun shines, we don't have to pay for sun. The water used in the project is, should be relatively inexpensive over a time horizon. And, that, and that's when you can really get to reduce cost is for your for our uh, kids and grandkids that'll be here that should see the, uh, the, the uh, debt-free project and, and have a much more radical uh, pricing reduction. Um, has, has this project received all of the necessary approvals? Um, I'm sure there's, there's many. Uh, I know that can be a very long process. Um, you know, where are we at in that process? And, and also, what, when, when did the effort begin, too? Well, the answer is no, we do not have all of the necessary approvals. We have a, a lot of approvals still to get. We're really on the early stage of that. Um, It'll be a year or so, probably a little more than a year before all the permits would be obtained for the project and it could start construction. It'll be a couple of year construction uh, duration after that. So the end goal is for various reasons, mainly tax credit expirations, the project needs to be in service by the end of 2025. So that's the ultimate end goal on this. Hopefully it can go in a little bit earlier, but things have to break right on some of the permitting and in the timeline. So it's a, there's a lot of permits on this project. It is complex with all the, with all the uh, different uh, landowners, and state agencies and the different technologies. And is that sort of par for the course too, when you are kind of debuting a, a new technology? Um, does it tend to have a, you know, some, some additional regulatory hurdles? You know, it's more that it's more this technology, the fact that we're going to be doing some fairly significant work on, on renovating reservoirs. We have to move a lot of dirt, fix things up. So it's a 
it's much easier to put a solar field down with some limited batteries around it than it is to have a project that spans miles uphill. Um, so it's more complex, more permitting. But the good thing is I, you, you touched on this earlier, Brittany, that it's, it's all existing assets. Um, the reservoirs are there, the ditches are there. For the most part, all the roads are there. So it's not really invasive work because all this area has already been disturbed, so to speak. Most of it's either been in farmland. Um, all the acreage on, on the plains and the not plains has been farmed as, as the area at the Poo Opai in the middle and the DHHL lands. And that's where most of our reservoir work, most of that's where the powerhouses would be. It's already uh, it's been, in, been in farmland. It's not uh, like we're taking away natural forest land or anything. And the other areas, it's all you know, it has been disturbed, the ditches are there, the reservoir is already there, the diversions further uphill where, where the uh, streams divert water to uh, feed, the, feed the project and irrigation, they're already there, they'll be, the diversions will be rehabilitated so they're more modern and can, can adjust better for weather conditions and, and make the stream levels stay at the areas they need to be versus the old uh, plantation era diversions that were set more to divert water, no matter what, how much uh, water was in the streams, these will all be modernized. And if the if the project does receive all of its approvals, do you have even just an estimate of how long the construction phase might take? It's about two years. And that's that's being conservative on the construction, depending on it's going to be weather dependent. And trying to get through uh, have two dry seasons to make sure they can meet the uh, meet the deadlines. And so apart from, uh, you know, the, the regulatory process that, that you're going through now, what challenges lie ahead that you can see now? I mean, what are the major um, hurdles or, or just, just um, you know, challenges that, that you see ahead uh, in order to get this online and, and keep it running smoothly? Well, like I said, we have to get through the permitting and the regulatory side. We also outside of constructing it, which will have its challenge, it's certainly doable, but I'm personally concerned about inflation coming in and making the project um, less attractive for, for AES as the, as the developer of it. Um, they can certainly handle any a reasonable amount of inflation, but if we get much higher than expected levels of inflation or interest rates go way up, that, that could stress the project. So. The economy is a, is a, is a concern. Um, I think it's a manageable concern. I, I don't see interest rates going 12% or anything like in the, the 70s that would put a project at risk, but it is pretty uncertain times now and really un, unparalleled times on the environment, on the economy. So that, that's a concern. Um, construction will be a challenge. It'll be, a, I, I think the engineers and the construction people are, are more than uh, confident they can do it and get it done in the, in the time frame. And really here and as any project done in Hawaii and, and more and more throughout the country, we have to continue to engage with the community and keep the community informed and, and working with it and uh, continue to build support on the project. Yeah, that's really interesting. Are there, are there other ways that this pandemic period has uh, shifted the, the direction of this project or, or um, added a little wrinkle or complication. I mean, this is such a strange time to uh, go to school, let alone you know, build a, a groundbreaking project. How, how has the pandemic uh, affected this effort? Oh, it's had a, had a huge impact, just like everything else. And it all comes down to people. You know, it's so much harder to connect with people. There's a lot of working with the, all the agencies and, and the permitting folks is really a, a people intensive uh, operation. That's all had to shift to Zoom. Working with our partners from AES, um, harder that, you know, we're not having frequent face-to-face -face project meetings. It's all done on Zoom and technical matters done on a, on a Zoom call is pretty difficult. Um, working with our, even within our own people here on Kauai, it's much harder to connect and to communicate with our community when we can't do it in person like we'd all like to. So 
it's been a it's been a real challenge for us as any other organization and any other uh, significant uh, activity. I, I think it's maybe been a little more on this because so much of this is communication oriented. We have to be able to communicate what we're doing to the agencies, to our stakeholders here in on Kauai and the community here on Kauai. And it's a complex project and. It's, we've really had to work hard on trying to keep the communications going in, in this environment. I've got a couple more questions here, but I just want to encourage folks who are listening in, if, if you'd like to ask your own question, uh, please think about submitting it in the next few minutes so we can get to that. Um, and, and David, really, you set me up. I mean, what else do you want people to understand about this? Are there misunderstandings that, that you want to, to clear up um, or just, just other aspects of this project we haven't gotten into? I mean, please tell us what, what you want people to, to know. What I want would like people to know is that this project has tremendous benefits for the community, um, tremendous benefits for the environment. Um, the infrastructure investments that we'll be making. And when I say we, it's more than KIUC. Ultimately, everybody on our island that uses electricity is going to be investing in this project because it's their electric bills that pay for it. So we feel this is a real win-win-win for, for us, the environment, and for, uh, for the community and the state because uh, our investment, your investment, the people that have... Uh, energy bills on Kauai will fund it. We can get the resources put into productive use. Um, even if you're not, a, not an electric user or electric bill payer here, if you go to Kokea, if you come over to visit Kauai and you go to Kokea, the facilities will be better. Um, you'll be able to access areas better. It'll help um, put Hawaiians in, into their homeland, get them into productive use on the, on the homestead property, which is really exciting. Um, DHHL is excited about this project. It's, it's key to their uh, development efforts on the west side. And it's a good technology. We've got, we've got some uh, great people working here. Um, our engineers are top notch, um, working with great companies. Um, the AES technical people are fabulous to work with, um, really doing innovative stuff. We're confident that they can deliver this project. And that's why we partnered up with them. So we're excited. Um, we think it can really progress our islands much closer to the 100% renewable, can move us from the 65, 70% we are now up to 85, 90%, um, bringing in an innovative technology in a, in a cost effective way, good for the environment, good for the community. So we're really excited about it. Thanks, David. And, and we do have an audience question here. Um, it says, although there seems to be major support for the project, what kind of pushback have you received? It's, a, it's like any project. There's always, always some pushback. It's, it's water-based projects. So any project in, in Hawaii, really anywhere that involves water, there's going to be concerns that the water is used properly and for the most beneficial use. Um, this project has a pretty strong story around the water use because we'll be using, we'll be, when it's all done, I, we'll be diverting less water than it was before the project started, started its formative years in the, in the 2011 period. There'll be less water diverted, more efficient use of it. It'll go to both agriculture and, and energy use, and it'll be maintained well and be able to regulate, be regulated well. But that's probably the biggest one. And it's a, uh, you know, it's a legitimate concern for the community. When you, whenever you divert water from a stream, there's trade-offs on that. When you move it from its natural, natural environment of a stream away from it, and you need to be able to make sure it's, it's uh, properly used and has benefits. And this project does have considerable benefits um, for the community. And it keeps the, we're, we're not diverting, we're diverting a fraction of the water in the Waimea River. So the river will be will be healthy. The stream will have first priority, and that'll be, be able to be regulated with a more modern technology at the diversions that can adjust to make sure that the stream always has the first uh, first call on the water that's available. It's the minimum in-stream flow standards have to be met, and it'll be able to adjust so they're always met, whether in, in periods of low rain. 
Thanks, David. Um, folks in the audience, I, I have one more question myself. So if you have any last minute questions, please feel free to, to chime in. Um, David, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but, but you know, KIUC has uh, piloted some, some really groundbreaking innovative projects as we've been discussing. What is this, you know, what do you think is coming next uh, 10 years from now? I mean, you must have some window into, into what's not quite possible yet, but, but coming in terms of, you know, renewable energy sources and, and how to do this in a way that's more economical and, and better for the environment. Can you share at all just maybe some projections of, of what things might look like in the, in the near future? Yeah, thank you for that question. I, my crystal ball says we're going to start shifting our focus more from renewable energy generation here to technologies, um, bringing in sophisticated uh, systems to manage load, to manage demand, particularly as, as electrical vehicle, electric vehicles come more into play. We have to have a way to make sure that every person on Kauai 20 years from now is not coming in and plugging in their electric vehicle at the exact same time. That would be a tremendous um, challenge for the system. We'd have to put in much more generation, work much harder to meet our renewable goals. So we have to continue to focus on technology, how to manage demand, how to manage our load to, uh, to uh, make sure that this technology is good and that we, we're eliminating carbon from the oil-based energy that's going into to, uh, fueling our vehicles today to using clean renewable energy to go into the vehicles. So that's going to be a challenge, how much load comes on, how much more energy is driven by the transition in the transportation industry, I think is going to be the major, major push. Um, technologies, it, it seems like PV panels, they've, they've gotten radically better over the last five or 10 years. I think they'll start, they'll continue to improve and pricing will be get, get better, but it's it's not gonna go a whole lot lower than it is today. Um, storage is the issue and hopefully battery technology continues to get more uh, um, robust and cheaper. Uh, President Biden's got a big push on trying to lower the cost of storage. So if we can continue to have lower cost PV, even if it's a little bit lower and battery prices drop, um, we can use that to supplement what's probably going to be load growth from electric vehicles. Very interesting. Um, we do have one more question from the audience. This is from Sequoia. It says, Kauai residents, especially those of the West side are concerned about KIUC's water use, water use. Did the project move from a closed loop system to one which will harvest and distribute an average of 11 million GPD? Can you please explain the 2017 settlement that caused this change? Can you address that, David? Yeah, I'd be pleased to. This project's gone through a, a lot of gyrations in the 10 or 12 years we've been uh, investigating hydro on the west side. It actually started out as a 100% uh, flow through hydro when we were first looking at it, it uh, evolved into a concept of a total closed loop uh, pump storage hydro back around 2014 or so. Um, and then as, as we went, there was a water mediation process that was instigated by uh, a lawsuit by Earth Justice and some of the community groups um, against the uh, waste in that system. That started, that was around the 2015 period, I think that took place. Um, KIUC was a party to the mediation on that. Um, mediation took a year and a half or so and had a groundbreaking uh, historical settlement around water where all the parties came together, the, the agriculture uh, interests on the Manah Plains, DHHL, the electric utility, and the uh, citizens groups represented by Earth Just Justice came together, um, working with the Commission of Water Resource Management, making sure that the streams were taken care of and the environment was taken care of. And it was a really groundbreaking. Water disputes typically take, can take a decade or more here in Hawaii. 
um, parties came together, everybody balanced the, the efforts, came up with, um, might not have made everyone happy. Nobody got everything they wanted. Everybody gains a little bit. Everybody loses a little bit in a, in a settlement process, but all the interests were weighed and, and a determination was made on how much water was needed for agriculture, how much was needed to stay in the streams. We ultimately then formed the project around the, the amount of water that was allocated for DHHL and for agriculture use. Um, the water was going to be transported. It made the most sense that we would, we as the utility would help transport it and use that to make energy on its way down to DHHL and on its way down to the plains for, for agriculture purposes. So that was all, it was really a groundbreaking mediation done then. And, and at that time, during the mediation process, the, the project evolved into the integrated uh, pump storage hydro and uh, flow through hydro that it is today. So, th so the current state of this project is very much so shaped by community input then, uh, it sounds. Yeah, community groups, um, were up, there was the mediation uh, participants all had a, had a say in their own way, um, you know, protecting whatever interest, the interest of the stream, um, concerns about the Waimea River levels, um, the agriculture people were looking for making sure they had stable water. Um, DHHL wanted water and wanted the ability to put uh, their beneficiaries on the land. And we were there to see if we could do it, if there was gonna be enough uh, resources for us to do an energy project. And, almost miraculously all those interests came together and came up with a settlement and enabled this project to go forward. So it really was a remarkable, we could probably spend an hour or so talking about the mediation process and all the uh, parties. There's some, some uh, good videos out there on the Commission of Water Resource Management that they had the foresight of taking videos of all the participants back when the settlement was done and getting all the inputs and have that safe for posterity. So it's a pretty remarkable process. Great. Uh, thank you, audience members who, who participated with some questions. Um, Roger, would you like to, to rejoin us? Yeah, um, I live in on um, the windward side of Oahu and there's a tremendous squall of rain outside hitting my tin roof. <laughs> So if you hear a strange sound, that's what it is. Anyway, that was a, uh, I think it's an absolutely fascinating project. And, and uh, uh, it's, it seems so essentially simple. And yet, um, you know, I guess without really good batteries, it, would, it wouldn't have worked. And without computers to manage it, it wouldn't, wouldn't work. Did you address the, the management, the technical management? Well, it's a managing, a, first of all, it starts off as a grid that we have to have all the KIUC integrated uh, management that our system, our grid operators use. So they'll ultimately balance the entire energy needs of the island. The project itself will have very sophisticated technologies managing the load between the batteries, the pumping and the solar fields will always have to stay in balance. So. It's going to be a lot of uh, technology, a lot of uh, control systems and, and computer systems in play that are really ultimately designed and designed and uh, um, transitioned by our operators here on Kauai and with, with the AES technology and technicians will work together to come up with a, with a system that works. And really on a, on a small grid like ours, it has to work. It has to work right or it can cause, cause real problems. So the, the technicians and the, the engineers really have to work closely together. The, the uh, experts from AES have to work with us to make sure we don't have uh, flaws because it can have uh, very bad impacts on a grid if it's not done right. So we've done it before, we've been innovative before, we're comfortable, we can do it with our team and with the AES team and, and make a very good project work from a technical side. And, uh is there a redundancy built in? I mean, if, if the software goes wrong for whatever reason, is there a way to um, cover that situation? <clears throat> oh yeah, the engineers all, always wanna have uh, redundant systems. And a, a nice part about this is even the technology is uh, somewhat redundant because 
PV, if the sun's not shining, we'll have all this storage sitting up in the reservoirs, stored energy in the reservoirs. So in periods when we don't have a lot of sun shining on our island and our, our grid would be going back to being dependent on fossil fuel more and more, we can take the stored energy out of the reservoirs, let it go downhill and, and produce energy. So it's even got redundancy to the, to the sun to some extent. Well, interesting. Well, um, I don't have any, any more questions, but uh, Brittany, I think it's a good time, good moment to close. Uh, um, I'd like to thank, thank you uh, very much for spending this time with us. I know you're a very busy person and uh, we really appreciate the, the uh, elaboration of, of the project. Uh, and I wish you all the best of luck with getting it done. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you, Roger. Appreciate the opportunity to talk about the project. Uh, if anybody wants to learn some more, they can go to our West Kauai Energy Project on the website. You can look it up and there's a, there's a whole site set dedicated to the project and some of the technologies and, and uh, approaches to it. So it's out there on the web and uh, encourage people that are interested to look. I have one last question. Is it going to become a tourist attraction? <laughs> Parts of it may. <laughs> My uh, board of directors uh, joked that they had, we needed to set up a, uh, a viewing area to uh, show off the technology. But uh, a lot of our projects have become kind of minor tourist uh, attractions. We get a lot of uh, requests for tours, um, really for a for us as small as we are, it's kind of became a challenge to, to accommodate. So maybe this one will, will be big enough that uh, some uh, enterprising uh, community group can decide they want to lead tours to it. <laughs> maybe it's a source of revenue. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much and uh, really appreciate it. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs>